Hi, this is the Truth of Love, and this is Clutch. Today's topic is the letter. Now, the letter is something I wrote, I believe at this point, it's almost six years ago, <laughs> when I exited a relationship with a fearful avoidance, and at the time, I was feeling a huge amount of insecurity, and I didn't quite know how to deal with the situation. And in the end, I decided that I was going to um, essentially write down my feelings and to try to, at the very least, uh, come to a conclusion on what it was I was seeing at the time. Now, one thing I, I do want to clarify, this email was written with a huge amount of anxiety. And part of the growing process in, in dealing with a breakup and dealing with one's emotions is getting those emotions out, but also understanding that the association with the situation, um, the stress that it entails, and the emotional anxiety that results from it tend to be very situational. In other words, they will periodically and very gradually reduce over time. And it's only when we're in a clear mindset where we've removed ourselves from that trigger, that emotional trigger, that we can truly analyze a situation for what it is. So the breakdown of this particular letter is that I explain how my ex and I first met. We ended up meeting on a dating app, and there was a quite considerable age gap between us, about 10 years. And with that came this, uh, what I have since come to determine is a maturity gap. But the term incompatibility often came up because we had different life goals, we had different achievements, we had different ways of looking at our lives. She was just coming out of university and I was entering the first fold of my career and developing into what I am today, which I had a, a plan in mind, which was I wanted to eventually move to California and I wanted to continue um, advancing the corporate ladder. And eventually I wanted to get to a certain level where I could live comfortably. Now, it's not to say that my ex didn't share this value system, but we had some conflictions. The first confliction happened to do with family. I myself came from a very toxic family, and with that background came this association of wanting to separate, to want to put some distance between themselves and I in regards to the ability to feel safe in my own realm. And uh, the support network I had growing up wasn't really the best, so I felt the safest when I was away from them. At least I've come to that conclusion over many years and many therapy sessions. But my ex, God bless her, was, was very different. She was from a very codependent relationship with her family. And although I have my personal opinions on whether or not the dynamics she had with her family were healthy, where she was at that particular time was no different than where I was when I was her age. And this really brought out some aspects of my life and particularly why I was attracted to this person in the first place. This person was a representation of my earlier self, how I happened to be in my early to mid-20s. So part of my connection with her is me revisiting these events, revisiting this mindset I had about wanting to change the world, about wanting to be a hero in others' eyes, about wanting to save people, and truly seeing it from the eyes of, of someone who not necessarily is innocent, but someone who lacks that relative experience. And it's not to say that that optimism or that hope is a bad thing. It's a good thing to have, and it's a good motivator to get you started. But this is where we often run into that term of incompatibility, or what I call maturity. Part of her experience and part of her belief structure is defined by her environment. So the environment she surrounded herself with was usually around enablers, people that pushed for the best in her, which again, isn't a bad thing. But at a certain point, we all have to get to a certain point to a certain level where we truly understand our capabilities and our more specifically, we truly understand our limitations. And she wasn't quite there yet. Where I was in that situation when I was in her position was something very similar. I had a huge sense of optimism, a huge sense of wanting to change the world, but I could only do it. I could only feel enabled to do it when I surrounded myself with powerful people, with people that I felt constantly brought a level of reassurance to me. 
It's not to say that this was a malice mindset. It's not to say that um, she lacked maturity because of this mindset. It's to say that the lack of experience resulted in a viewpoint that I myself, 10 years after the fact, can look back on and say, okay, I, I understand where I came from, but it's not necessarily something I agree with. And this is the beauty of no contact and the beauty of dating other people and gaining perspectives and meditating and going to therapy. It's the ability to look at your situation and truly comprehend not only where you came from, but after you have done a certain level of healing and you have brought down that anxiety, eventually looking and turning the lens back on your partner and saying, okay, I've addressed where I went wrong. Let's address where they went wrong. And this is something that most people tend to forget because for the most part, um, especially in the go, go, go society that we live in today, that's all about instant gratification. The important thing for most people is to find a replacement supply, to find the other person that helps keep that distraction going. This is something that's notorious with fearful avoidance in particular because there's a need of keeping the stimulation up. There's a need of keeping this distraction going because if that distraction at any moment gets diminished, we then have to then look at ourselves in the mirror. And of course, what we see in the mirror can be rather traumatizing and rather re-triggering. So we want to be in a mindset of constant go, go, go. This is where we usually get the the typical fearful avoidant entrepreneur in their early 20s that constantly looks for that high or the uh, extreme level avoidant that becomes an entrepreneur and is constantly a workaholic and constantly looking for new stimulations and has routines. It's all a coping mechanism. And of course, the coping mechanism does have some benefits. It has some benefits in its ability to calm us down, but it doesn't address the underlying issue. I've often said the best thing that people can do during a breakup is to go to the gym and exercise, but that's not the only thing they should be doing. In fact, it's only a coping mechanism in the short term because all it's doing is rebalancing your chemical um, dependencies. It's not actually addressing the actual cause of the dependencies themselves, which is usually disconnections of neurons in the brain. And of course, those can only be remapped as we start thinking about other things and we start processing the trauma that we happen to go through. So that trauma in itself is, is quite interesting in the sense that it helps define our character. And that's something that we don't tend to think about, especially when we're going through a traumatic event or going through a traumatic breakup. Some of the best experiences I've had in my life, whether I've been betrayed by a friend or betrayed by a coworker that ended up costing me my job. Um, I was talking to a couple of friends on the Discord the other day and I started laughing about there was this one person I knew back in Ottawa who essentially knew how to push my buttons and push my buttons to a certain point where I ended up swearing at him in the office. And the first thing he did was go to my boss and, and essentially rat me out and he cost me a promotion. But it was through that action that I ended up taking that energy and that frustration and I invested it in getting a new resume done and applying for new jobs. And I ended up finding a job later that month that nearly brought up my salary by about 40%. And it's the result of getting that job that's turned into the catalyst that is my career today. And had he not done that, I wouldn't have gone through the changes and the career development that I've gone through thus far. So it's kind of ironic in the sense that usually it's the bad experiences that help define us for the better. Although at the moment and at the time, we're usually very um, particular about how these experiences help mold us and change us, uh, especially when it comes to a breakup, because a breakup, and the breakup in this particular situation with a fearful avoidant, like, this breakup hit me hard, like, full disclosure, um, I went through months of depression, um, I went through months of reflection, and this was the first serious relationship after my narcissistic ex, so I carried a lot of that guilt from that previous relationship into this relationship, and because I was trying to replace that supply, and because I had not done the work or the significant amount of therapy required in order to build a level of security, I unfortunately compromised this relationship and brought my insecurities into the next partner, which is usually what I warn you all about, especially when you're looking to reconnect with other people. I, I will usually jump in and say, look, it's okay to date other people. It's okay to see if there's a connection out there. But as far as getting into a serious committed relationship, 
it's important that you work on yourself first. And for someone who is on an extreme level, um, someone that has bipolar or borderline personality disorder, being in a relationship can be absolutely detrimental to your self-development. In fact, it will actually make you worse before it makes you better. It's not to say that it's always like this, but the vast majority of cases, we usually tend to date people that tend to enable our behavior and not the other way around. And of course, if we date people that tend to challenge us, depending on what kind of uh, personality you have on the spectrum or what kind of love language you fall under, this can be a traumatizing experience in itself. So it's important for us to have a good understanding. Part of me writing this letter where I talked about the situation and I talked about what went wrong in this relationship and I talked about particularly the specifics and where I felt she didn't give me enough of a chance. I look at this detail now and I start understanding, look, it wasn't just her, it was me that was part of the problem. And I have to take ownership of my issues. Then later on, I can start taking ownership of her issues once I've addressed my own stuff. But it takes me addressing my own stuff before I can go back and psychoanalyze my ex. And this is something that all of you, absolutely all of you are guilty of doing. I usually have to deal with someone who might send me an email or might send me an instant message on the Discord saying, my ex was this and this is everything that's wrong with them and I want to save them. Which, I'm not saying there's something wrong with the analysis, but I am saying that there's something wrong with the approach. The approach can never be to win this person back and particularly it can never be about saving this other person. If you're making it about the other person, you are by definition a codependent. You're making it all about them. It's important for you to understand that being in a loving relationship and having mutual understanding and mutual respect and having self-value comes from the self-preservation aspect of any self-interested person. Part of us building that exercise, part of us building that character comes from the ability to look at ourselves and say, look, I screwed up badly in this situation. So did my partner, by the way. But that's not the point, at least initially at the beginning of the breakup. The point is to get a full understanding of what it is we need to work on, what it is about ourselves, this imperfection that has shown itself in this relationship, and why in particular are we attracted to this kind of person? Because usually we're attracted to this kind of person, quoting one of my former therapists, we're usually attracted to people that either A, remind us of our childhood, or B, remind us of aspects about ourselves that we have yet to address. So, is it going to be a case where you're attracted to someone that represents that inner child, that represents that part of you that you haven't addressed? And it's through this trauma and it's through this initially negative experience that you can truly start understanding what it is that you truly need to start working on, where you can truly start understanding where you bring value into life, let alone a relationship. I know that this is a tough time for most of you especially those of you that are finding yourself signal post-pandemic. Life is relatively and slowly going back to normal. And with that normality comes the realization, I have to live my life again. I can no longer stay the majority of my time indoors. I can no longer be a social hermit that I once was. I now have to take a level of responsibility. And in the majority of your cases, at least the majority of you that find yourselves on my channel, you're going to find yourself in a scary situation, alone, against what you intended on, at least at the beginning of this pandemic. So what comes from the situation and this sudden independence? A lot of pain, a lot of tears. I won't lie to you. These are going to be some of the hardest months slash weeks of your life. But with this pain, with this suffering, and more in particularly with this understanding, with this connection, because you'll meet other people that are in similar situations. Take a look at the comments in most of my videos. How many times have we heard the same story again and again and again? You're not alone. The question is, are you going to seek out appropriate help and appropriate support? And are you going to start building the support structure that you need to survive on your own before you introduce someone else? And then bring out the best of yourself in order to ensure success in the next relationship. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, I would ask that you hit the thumbs up icon below. 
For those of you that haven't subscribed, I would highly recommend that you do. And of course, if you haven't joined our Discord, a link can be found in the description below. We have well over 500 members. We're going to continue to grow the support system. I'm really enthusiastic about this, guys, and I hope that we can make 2022 the best year ever. With that said, this is Clutch, signing off.